Okay, Excellent. awesome. Hi guys, we're local to each other. <laughs> we are. We are appropriately socially distanced. We are. Uh, we wanted to evoke the theater experience, so we are approximately less than one inch apart. Um, but we have been apart from each other for too long. So after two weeks of being very, very responsible, we're finally together. Oh, together again. And it's so isn't nice. it joyous? <laughs> All right, now it's let's talk about something important. Let's talk about why you're here today. Yes, pitching. Well, well wait, wait, wait. Before you, before you tell them that, I just want to tell you guys, just give you some ground rules on Zoom. Go. I mean, you probably all have been on Zoom already, but just in case you haven't, this is your first Zooming, your first Zoom outing, just know that you, we have a Q&A, so you can type into the chat any questions that you have along the way as we speak, um, and we will do our best to answer them as we go, because that's probably the best part of the whole thing. I so, know. We right? love the cues. You want me to tell them who you are? Yes. I'm oh, Larry Rogowski. I'm Sue Gillard. Okay, we're done. Okay. Welcome. Um, we love pitching shows, you guys. And you know how Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to get good at anything. The Beatles played for 10,000 hours. Bill Gates coded for 10,000 hours. Larry and I together have pitched for roughly 10,000 hours. And we were really stinky stinkles at it in the beginning. But we learned a few key things. And we hope to make your journey to smooth pitching totally effortless and we want to save you all of our 10,000 hours of mucking it up. She mucked it. I will tell you right now. I, I've, I heard some of the muck. Yeah, that's true. Like, I didn't know I, what I to say, mucked. so I invented, he was perfect. Right. But I, I didn't know what to say, so I invented <laughs> things. Okay, don't invent things. Leave that to the people who write shows. Um, and uh, when you don't know something, own it. But one of the nice things about being a producer is you have a team around you. Nobody is a one-man band. So that when you don't know the answer to a question, say, I love that question. Let me make sure I'm going to get you the right answer. Let me talk to the team and swing back to you. Yeah? So the way that I like to pitch my show, and I'll tell you guys, and, and this is hard to illustrate in a webinar, I think, but 90% of what we do uh, when we're pitching is ask questions. So dialogue with a person, figure out, look, are you a musical person? Are you a straight play person? Are you a big flashy ball change kick? Are you like sobbing, just huge puddle mess? Are you weird experimental? Do you only want Broadway? Do you only want a uh, risky downtown will never be commercial? What's your vibe? What are your favorite shows? What do you love? And then the way that I like to pitch is I always like to give people options. So in a perfect world, I will give them options of two shows. If I'm not working on two shows or I'm not working on a film or a show at the same time, then my option question is always, who do you know who? Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back and start with, how do you pitch? How do you create a successful pitch for the show that you're working on? For me, it's no more than three, three for Inglorious Bastards, three for Americans, there. Three, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I do, actually, yeah. uh, <laughs> Good three, reference. Um, three, I'm incredibly comfortable here, by the way. I want to tell you, <laughs> with my ass, I'm happy to. Okay, three elements. Element one, one sentence overview of what the show is. Moulin Rouge, based on the hit film by Baz Luhrmann, starring Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman. Usually then what I have to say parenthetically is that neither Ewan nor Nicole will be in the stage version of Moulin Rouge because more people ask than you would think. So based on the phenomenal film, what we're going to be doing with the stage, why it's going to be special and unique and why you're gonna to have to see the stage production is because you are going to be inside the Moulin Rouge. You are going to be part of the cabaret experience, something that cannot be replicated on film. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share with you that our director is the extraordinary Alex Timbers, best known for many, many things, but among them, Beetlejuice, Bloody Bloody, Andrew Jackson, and is creating a visionary story with the help of Uncle Baz, which is what everybody calls Baz Luhrmann. Would this be a good show for you? Or who do you know who would be excited to work with us on bringing Moulin Rouge to the stage? That was good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, you know your stuff. Great, so too bad we don't have any more investment units in We it. don't. That <laughs> ship has sailed, folks. But, <laughs> but, but Sue's point earlier is like, you have to know your audience. Like, who are you speaking to? Because that will really inform what you're going to talk about and how you're going to speak about it. And even the tone and everything. Because otherwise, you're just like this kind of salesperson out there trying to sell a show. And we never want to be that guy or that girl. 
You want to do it for Jagged? Three yeah. sentences? Yeah, so Jagged Little Pill is a, a new musical based on the music of Alanis Morissette. But here's the thing. Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill album sold millions and millions of records. 15 right? million. Thank you for that exact number. That's what I'm here. But we brought in Diablo Cody to write this incredible book. So it's not about Alanis Morissette because her life is cool, but maybe not so interesting. However, Diablo Cody writes a really interesting story about a family in Connecticut that has some problems. And the music feels fresh. Like it's the first time you're hearing it. It feels current. And I have to tell you, when I first went to the workshop of Jagged Little Pill, I was, I was a puddle on the floor. So I knew that I had to be part of it. And I know that most people would want to be part of this project just because of what it does to your heart and to your gut and to your emotions. Who do you know who leads with their gut and wants something that's current and vibrant and right now and immediate? One of the things, I'll talk a little bit about Jagged because for me, um, uh, Jagged was a part of my sort of seminal youth, right? And a lot of people my age who have teenage kids are now coming to see when the show plays, yeah? They're coming to see Jagged Little Pill with their teenage kids and they're introducing the music of their mm -hmm. youth and their kids are hearing it differently. They're hearing it based on today. It's brand new to them. So that's kind of a neat, that's a neat angle of Jagged Little Pill that we didn't, ex I didn't necessarily expect and certainly I didn't pitch until we had audiences and the audiences were telling us about it. Okay. And, well, it's interesting, you know, when you look at the different times that you'd pitch a show, you know, a lot of people think about pitching a show is when you're first getting started, right? Like it's the germ of an idea and you want to get investors interested or producers interested and maybe some of the creatives interested. So your pitch is going to be different than as if the show is running, you may be pitching for, well, there's a national tour that's going to kick off or production in London or in Australia or wherever, or it's going to go on a cruise ship. So your pitch is going to be slightly different depending on the stage of the game that you're at. Yeah. So now we're in, let's give an example of a show that hasn't opened yet, yeah? Great. So now we're in pre, 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 pre for The Outsiders, based on Essie Hinton's seminal novel that has sold over 15 million copies and is required reading in a lot of American middle schools, has been translated into 50 million languages. No, has been translated into 50 languages. That'd be a lot more languages. Yeah. And um, Francis Ford Coppola made a film in 1983, with some now famous actors, Tom Cruise, Rob Lowe, Patrick Matt Swayze. Dillon, Patrick Swayze, RIP, uh, Ralph Macchio, my boyfriend, uh, C. Thomas Howell, and uh, The Outsiders lives in three generations psyches, right? So now we have a musical version of it written by Jamestown Revival, and the music supervisor is Justin Levine, who we've worked with on Moulin Rouge, and we're going to have an out-of-town tryout at the Goodman Theater uh, with The Outsiders probably in the next season. And does this resonate with you? Is this a, are, first of all, are you familiar with the book? Because we literally said, you remember this to one of our investors? I said, so The Outsiders, and she went, <gasps> and it, 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 <laughs> it, so it you're, wouldn't you know, have mattered. What you're going to say is going to change, and it doesn't matter what you say, it's kind of, it's how you say it and who you're talking to, because it could be just as easy as that. There could be that one thing, especially with a title like The Outsiders, that does make it a bit easier. But what if you have a title people don't know? Then what do you do? You, know, okay, you don't have that instant recognition. Okay, so let's, let's use Lamador Arms as an example, because that's a okay, good one. Great, great. So, so um, we're going to get into the realm of film now, because there's a film that we've optioned. It's called Lavender Arms. So let me just set the stage for you. So it's about this guy who's retired, and he's very cranky, and he's old, and his wife has just died. He has one grandson who's desperately trying to get him to move to a retirement village, and he's digging his heels, and he's not going to go, he's not going to go, not going to go. Finally, he gives in, and he, he agrees to go. He ends up in a retirement village in Florida called Lavender Arms. What do you know? It's a gay and lesbian, LGBT retirement Q. home lgbtq Plus. <laughs> there's so many pluses these days um retirement home and he ends up you know finding love and friendship in the least likely of places so it's a beautiful heart heartfelt story but you can imagine the comedy that happens within this fish out of water story and uh, i mean in the characters i mean think about all the especially the LGBTQ plus older actors right now who would love some of these plum roles. And it's a great time for a film like this. Right, because people, every, there's a universality to mm. it that everybody's aging and they find themselves disappearing and becoming less relevant. 
And then also the LGBTQ plus communities that weren't really able to public ga publicly gather a generation ago now have their own aging communities. And what does that look like? So who would care about this, Larry? Who would you pitch Lavender Arms mm -hmm. to? Who would you pitch the outsiders to? All right, we'll stick Lavender Arms first, shall we? Yeah. Like, I always think of low-hanging fruit first. <laughs> no pun intended. Oh. So an older <laughs> gay audience. You know, there's, um, I mean, really, you want to think about, you're like, if you're looking for investment, look for money, um, you know, typically older people are going to have more um more dollars to invest yeah, in they've accrued wealth over time. alternative sleeve investments, which is exactly what theater or film is. You know, you're not talking to someone who like, they're worried about paying their rent next month. That's not your best investor or your best producing partner. So that's, I would say that's a low hanging fruit for that one. Definitely the, the gay and lesbian community of a certain age, especially. Good. And that's actually not too hard because the gay and lesbians in their 70s, 80s, 90s, dare I say, were, having kids wasn't the most popular option. Usually you had a kid sort of by accident, you know, your sister couldn't take care of them or whatever. Now it's different. So they, in general, they will have more disposable income than uh, people our age who are raising kids in general. Right. Okay, so who's a perfect fit for, well, let's do, let's do something because I think a lot of people on this are going to be pitching shows that don't have uh, brand recognition. Yeah. All right, so let's do a show with very little brand recognition. Um, what have we ever pit? Well, I would say Josh, right? Josh Cohen? Oh, yeah, the other Josh Cohen, sure. Um, which we produced off Broadway last season at the Westside Theater in New York City. Uh, uh, <laughs> we love that damn show. <laughs> so, but it was interesting because, well, that show was, was funny. It, it didn't have recognition. However, it did have us, it had a small following yep. because people knew the writers very well because they're, they're, Broadway guys, they've been around for a long time. Um, David Rossmore and Steve Rosen. And they're beloved it. in the industry. Mm -hmm. So it had that going for it. However, to the average person, it wasn't a recognizable title. It so wasn't what like do, a film how, or how do you describe, like, what do you, what do you say? It's called The Other Josh Cohen. What's it about? Oh, boy. So The Other Josh Cohen. So this poor guy, guess what his name is? Josh Cohen. So down on his luck. He's having a rough time. Can't find love. Can't find a job. Can't find anything worthwhile in life. And he has a moment where he gets a ridiculous amount of money sent to him in the mail. A mysterious envelope arrives and it turns the whole page of his life. And what does he do in the face of it? Is the actual, is, it's made out to Josh Cohen, but is it made out to him or another Josh Cohen? So he has a moral dilemma that happens and his, his big quandary in the musical is, does he do the right thing, which he's always done all his life and then like kind of lose out on it? Or does he be a little sneaky and get everything he's always wanted? We find out what he decides to do. Should we course. tell him? I mean, Should we ruin the whole show? Tell him why not. He ends up doing the right thing, the upstanding thing. And for the first time in his life, he gets exactly what he wants, but didn't know what he wanted, which is love and partnership. It's awesome. It All right. Is. So you guys, listen, we want to help you pitch your shows. So if you have a show that you want to practice honing your pitch, you can write in the chat. Can they write in the chat? They totally write can, yeah. Write in the yeah. chat a little bit about your show, and Larry and I will riff on pitching your show for you. We'll practice pitching it. We will keep in mind, sometimes I say things that aren't true. I might say things that aren't true, and then you can be like, I'm never going to say that in my pitch. <laughs> do you guys actually, all right. Hi, Eric. I don't know you, but the King's Speech. Do you want us actually to pitch the King's Speech? Because that was a killer movie. And it is also, from what we hear, a killer play. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't know any of the details about the King's Speech play, but let me make it up and give it a shot. Okay, so you know the seminal, the King's Speech with Jeffrey Rush and the hot guy. Oh. Hot guy and the hot guy. Um, what the heck is his name? The hot guy. Type it in there, Eric, I know you know Eric, his name. You know it. Help us out here for a second. So the him. film got a tremendous amount of accolades and why we're bringing it to the stage is because this is a journey that everyone can relate to. This is someone who was born into royalty, trapped in his golden cage, and yet wasn't able to step into the role of king because his stutter stopped him. And what he found by having to become, uh, what he found by having to train to surmount that was he found the friendship of a lifetime. And this is a story that anybody can relate to. It's incredibly beautiful on stage. We really love that the audience comes together and that by intermission, they're all feeling exactly that same vulnerability that you feel when you're watching a film, except it's a shared experience. Is any of that true? 
<laughs> Eric, type in and tell us, is, is any of that work? Can you lift any of that for yourself and use that when you're, I'm assuming maybe this is your project, maybe you're on the producing team of it, um, you may be pitching to investors. That was beautiful, I'm sold, okay. Great. So we have units of 50,000, I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. What else have we got? So um, when, when Larry and I pitch a show, Sometimes in the beginning, I used to notice that I was talking too much. All right, so like in life, I talk too much. You guys, five minutes annoying me, you can work that out already. But uh, I always notice if I'm in the middle of a pitch and I feel that like I'm losing them, I'm talking too much, shut up, Sue. I literally just shut my mouth. And I go, you know, you probably have a question at this moment. What question can I answer for you? That's the best thing I have to say. So I think so many people get caught up when you're pitching in the pitch and getting it right and having all the right words and you're not paying attention to the person you're actually talking to and watching them sort of glaze over as you're speaking, which is you see what happens. Who does that? Wait a yeah. minute. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you really, you, you, yeah, it's just good, guys. It's acting 101, right? It's putting your attention on the other guy. It's, it's seeing what's going on over there because you can pivot based on what's happening with the person. And again, it's all about the who do you know who. It may not be about that person in front of you. Can we say more about who do you know who? Because it's so valuable. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So just to make it really clear, what we mean by that is every single person you talk to, and this is such a valuable lesson to learn, is, is a window or a doorway into a whole network of people that you don't know yet. I've met some of the most phenomenal people in my life through people's, 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 people. You know, so you always have, and that goes on infinitely. You just never know who it's gonna be, which is why, of course, you always wanna be your best self and you always wanna be authentic and um, be open to whatever is possible when you're talking to someone. If it ain't right for them, that's okay. The timing may not be right. The timing may be right a year from now or two years from now, but the timing could be right for someone that they know who is actively looking for what you have to offer. And we, we never want the feeling that we ran out of our list. So we're, uh, Larry and I are very, very out there as much as we can be in a respectful way when we are pitching a show, trying to get a theater for a show, trying to get front money for a show. And we tell everybody in our community what we're up to and very specifically what we're looking for, right? So we are currently, okay, we're not. But when we were raising most recently for the outsiders, we said, guys, we're raising $50,000 units, yeah. mm -hmm. $50,000 units for the outsiders. Who do you know who just melted over that book or that film? Who do you know who wants to get into a show before we're guaranteed a Broadway theater because your terms are better? Who do you know who wants to be part of our team? And we are, I think Larry and I are really good about sharing as much information as we possibly can about what's happening in the show. In fact, we got an update today about the outsiders and shared it with our investors because information is changing by the minute. So I tell everybody in my community, especially the people who don't have the funds, who don't have the interest, who don't care about theater, because all of them have another person who's crazy Broadway like I am. Okay, mm. we have questions. We do. Um, do you want to take this? And hi, Anne. What about associations with groups like The Field? I worked with them to produce a show by Philip Dimitri Galas called Performance Hall. Performance Hell. Seriously. The totally glasses. different thing. You need glasses. <laughs> a vaudevillian styled showboat artist. I hell. That does say hell. That yes, word says yes, hell. Yes. Paying for their crides of vanity and conceit. They have 501c3 status, which means they're tax exempt, tax deductible to donations, an umbrella organization. If I have one or two shows I want to produce, is this the best way to set up an organization to receive monies? Okay. Great. Mm, so we question. dealt with this with Popsicle. Do you remember? Yes, yes. So uh, it was like, and I'm going back. Um, but we produced a oh, show oh, for the, oh, 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 it was so good. <laughs> it was so God. good. It had right. one of the current Dear Evan Hansons in it. Um, so we produced it for the Fringe Festival, is yeah. that right? And mm -hmm. we raised funds through one of the 501c3's Fractured Atlas, I feel mm -hmm. like. And the greatest thing about that was we did a Kickstarter campaign or like a Facebook campaign, now I can't remember. And you could donate as little as like five bucks. And you could donate through the 501c3, so it was clean. So we didn't need to manage a bank account, which you don't necessarily want to do early on. And because like you're dealing with enough stuff hands-on as a producer, you don't want to think about like, where did the money go? And what did I, oh shoot, did I accidentally spend that on my kids' shoes? You know what I mean? So that can be a really clean way to raise money. And sometimes it's tax deductible for your um, donors. I remember something we tried, we did this for 
homeschool, and we did this for Josh Cohen too. I was going to talk about that. Yeah. Oh, we'll talk about Josh Cohen and Jiva. Yeah, because yeah. oh, this so is sort little. of interesting. So we were, we were commercial producers of the show, the other Josh Cohen off Broadway, but um, there was a production of it done at Jiva Theater in Rochester. Really great production. And um, we got to learn a lot from it. It was really cool. And when it was time to move the show to off Broadway, we um, had a great conversation with them. They wanted to be involved somehow. So they thought, well, let's have, well, they didn't think, we, we all thought together, let's have um, people be able to donate money to them because they're a not-for-profit theater, right? To donate money that would, would be earmarked for the other Josh Cohen. So essentially, on top of the money we were raising commercially for the show, which is straight on investment, we had an option for people who maybe couldn't invest a, a unit of $25,000, which was the minimum, but wanted to do you know, $1,000 or $5,000 or even $10,000 into the show. So we were able to have them do a tax deductible donation through Jiva Theater, and that was put to our show. And the beauty of that was that the money came to the production, but it didn't have to be recouped in the show. So um, people got a tax deduction for the money that they and they got they their the uh, answering machine. They got they Steve did. They got, on their answering they machine. They got really cool um, <laughs> uh, prizes, you know, like We should like say perks. something about the prizes, though, because the perks that we gave out for the other Josh Cohen, none of them were actual anything. items. They weren't things we needed to mail. They were stuff we could give away for free. So it was either a download of a song or the download of the album, I think, mm -hmm. or like the Grand Pooba was. If you saw the show, you know that there's an answering machine message that figures prominently into the show. And Steve Rosen, uh, one of our two writers and stars, who's just a gem, he, he said, if you donate, I forget how much now, uh, I will leave an outgoing answering machine message on your phone. And most of the investors are old enough that they have answering machines. So that meant something. <laughs> that really did mean something that to meant them. Something it was good. So if you can create a win-win like we did with Jiva, that they were able to be associate producers on the show, that we were able to bring in money to capitalize a show that we didn't need to recoup. And more importantly, that we could have Jiva as a strategic partner and boots on the ground and people, you know, again, people in Rochester know lots of people in New York City and they were telling their friends, I helped help, hey, I helped make this show happen. You need to go see it. So the answer to your question, Anne, is yes, it can be really helpful to partner with a nonprofit, particularly if you have a smaller show, particularly if you have uh, lots of um, individual supporters who want to be able to open up their wallets, but not to the tune of a four or a five or a six figure investment. Yeah, really, that's very good, very good advice. So you have more questions here, so let's see. Um, oh, from Tony, uh, the show is Falling in Love with Mr. Delamort. I saw that a long time ago. The first show written for The Theremin. It's The Theremin Show. I remember The Theremin Show. Okay, um, a melodramatic comedy similar to Little Shop or Rocky Horror. Good yes. comparisons, great. We are considering doing a concept album similar to a concept con film. Oh, concept film. Ooh. We both need glasses. Yes, seriously. <laughs> similar to a concept album, the full music, but with some staging and visuals. Prior to staging it, what kind of things should we consider when pitching this? Mm. Okay, wait. So the concept film would be full music, but some staging and visuals. So the concept film would be more of a pitch deck, right? It would be the thing to pitch the full production. It wouldn't be the completed film. Is that right? Pitch film. Um, okay. Pitch film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it would be a pitch film. Oh, for us, it's going to be. Hang on. You can, and I may have something else to say. Go ahead. For me, that's going to be all about the financials. That's what I was going to say. Because I would <laughs> want to figure out what kind of, what can I use that asset for later? If I am using that money, $5,000, $50,000, $500,000 to produce a concept film that cannot be used as a final asset to sell to Netflix or Amazon or Broadway HD or any of the new streaming uh, sites that you're going to see pop up like weeds over the next few months, then I would question the value of it. If you are only creating a film to be able to raise money, find some partners who are good at raising money. Don't spend your precious front money dollars on making a film. Spend your front money dollars finding the right people who can pitch and get your um, project to the next place of realization. Although I will tell you, Tony, that um, pitching a film is a better idea right now at this moment than pitching theater. Correct. We're in a very interesting moment right now. You guys are all aware and things are getting pushed and pushed and pushed. So if you, if you could do anything that's on film or like webisodes, anything like that, go for it because that's the kind of content that's going to be valuable right now. Um, 
I was just going to say, just to add on quickly, just, you know, we did um, an album for the other Josh Cohen before the show ever opened. The reason we did that is um, because we were waiting for theater, but, um, and we're not good at waiting. I think we talked about that on the last <laughs> webinar that we did. Waiting. But um, we, we did, it wasn't a huge outlay of money. It made sense. Now, if we were going to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it, we probably wouldn't have done it because it didn't make sense to spend that kind of money. But because it was costing us very little, we knew it would make sense because it would be a, a way to package and pitch the show um, as we were you know, coming to, to put it up on stage. And then, of course, in the licensing, which now it's licensed, so there's this great CD available. It's an all-star um, CD with like crazy names on it. Should we talk about how do you pitch during a pandemic? Ooh, is that is that a timely. good? I mean, I so, so Broadway is officially lights off intermission interval till June seventh. Some people are saying probably not till September. Other people are saying probably not until March of twenty twenty one, which should may coincide with an actual vaccine. So. While we're on pandemic holding, people are getting really, really creative about how they can get the word out there. One of the things that we're doing with Lavender Arms, which is our new film project, is that we are sourcing some of our dream cast because they're not on location and they're not on their honeymoon and they're staring at their TVs and computers like the rest of us. Mm. We're gonna source them for a private table read. Of course, everyone will be at their own table so that our writers can hear it but also so that we can build relationships with people that during real life, we would probably never be able to get in touch with. So here's the opportunity for everybody during pandemic times. Huge opportunity right now, because like Sue said, everybody's you know kind of thinking, okay, what am I gonna do? And there, people just have time and would love to hop into a project, even if it's, you know, who knows where it's gonna go, but it's just a chance to be seen. And now of course with Zoom and all these, these great ways that we can get ourselves out there, um, it's the perfect, it's the perfect outlet to do it and, and the perfect time, really. Yeah, and there's no reason not to because if you're going to be a producer, then you definitely want to get used to the word no. You want to get used to people telling you no, that's a crazy idea, it's never mm -hmm. going to work. And you go, thank you, I appreciate your input. And you move on with your idea and you keep moving forward with it. And you also want to get used to saying no. We, Larry and I were terrible at saying no for a while because by nature we're like happy, positive, you can make it happen, people. But then, uh, you know, a lot of people come to you with a lot of projects and you go, that project is wonderful. We only have finite resources and time. We have to commit first to the projects that we are already on board with. So I would say our plates are pretty full right pretty now. Pretty cool. Colin Firth. That's it. Who Thanks, said Eric, it? Hey, Eric, Eric way to go. It would have come to us sooner or later, Colin Firth in the King's Speech. Firth. That's right. Now, I want to tell you guys why I jumped on board The Outsiders, besides the fact that the script was incredible and the music was so incredibly haunting and beautiful. And I grew up on both the, um, the film and the book. But um, I made a deal with everybody who knows me that if Ralph Macchio, in however he looks right now, comes to the opening, I am talking to him. That is my negotiation with me and why I wanted to jump on board. <laughs> Do you want to tell these guys a story about you and Ralph Macho real no, quick? No, I don't. No, no funny. because I was just gaining everyone's respect. No. But you can tell the story. This is a wildly inappropriate story. Was it during when he was in How to Succeed in Business Without no, Really No, no, not in a, in a musical I would talk to him. No, he was in Cuba oh. and His Teddy Bear. A what? play. What was I know. I saw Was that him. on Broadway? Yes. Was, oh, okay, so you saw him in the show. It was at the Long Acre. And he was walking down the street and Sue literally, literally chased him down the street. I never ran so fast like in my life. Like a crazy Raven fan. Did you catch him though? No, he jumped that? in a cab and looked back at me like, do I look threatening? I don't know. So that was Sue's brush Great. with fame Great, now he'll never Macchio. want to meet me. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, we'll be at Opening got? Night of the Outsiders, we hope. Okay. So th there's a question back, yeah, Wait, back, back here. Back way. here. Uh, what do we got? Right, okay, captive, all right. all right. And Lily, you're right, we have so, captive audiences, exactly. Fake pitch, oh. fake, fake pitch, parentheses, back. Oh, okay. Back, two people jumping back through time and finding themselves in love or not depending on where in time they jump. Okay, so this is fun. I will tell you, Ethan, just based on your premise, this generally works better on film than on stage. And you will see it work sometimes successfully, working back, like jumping through time or also jumping through people. Notably, Tootsie and Mrs. Doubtfire both had a heck of a costume changes to get their um, people back believable as two different genders. Um, the same time, coming back and forth through time is gonna require 
some magic on your costume designers and your wardrobe department's part. So I think it's always doable. I think the magic of theater is fantastic. Just make sure that by the end of the night, your actors' faces aren't falling off by putting on prosthetics and taking off prosthetics but, but all the time. Ethan, maybe now's the time, because of everything we just talked about, that theater is at this intermission to think about, maybe, does it work better as a film? Maybe, just just something to think about. Not, not, we, we don't know the piece, so I haven't read it, I don't know it or anything like that, but um, take a look at it and see if, ha, huh, this might be, fit better on film or well, webisodes or something. Um, so I think a little bit more about who you're pitching to, not so much what you're pitching, but in general, I think you guys have heard this if you've ever taken like a resume building class in life or a, uh, how to speak in an interview, people are usually buying you. Sometimes people are just buying the project and they don't don't care about the details, but especially since we're we're fairly young produce we're fairly young. And we're also fair we're very young to be producers, heaven knows. Yes. So um That's my favorite thing when people say because when, <laughs> when we have conversations, they'll be like, Oh, we're we're producers, they go, You're so young to be a producer. No, you know what they it's say. It's the only to industry me? we're young in, it's great. But this is what they say to me, because you're a man. They go, Oh, who do you work for? My oh. favorite question. Larry Rogowski, of course. <laughs> Of course. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's totally the other way around. What are we talking about? That. What were we just talking about? Oh, uh, the, the buying say, you oh, element yeah. of the show. So Larry and I had zero credibility, so we had to jump on projects. It took us a little while to learn this, I think, but we had to jump on projects where there were people who had proven track records, and they were going to get the show over the finish line, and we were just sort of hopping in to be able to sit in the room and learn from them, right? Like, oh, yeah. I, I think some of the shows that we, that we were co-producers on, you know, it was a pleasure on Disaster to just sit on, the show was called Disaster, literally, um, exclamation point. It wasn't a disaster. Just, it, was, it, was it was not a disaster. A Tony nomination for Ms. Jennifer Samard and a New York Times critics pick. And, and wild, widely licensed now. And so widely licensed and so, we all want so much licensing, fun. Right? And Larry and I, this is when we were two. Okay, so let's tell you a couple of fun things. So we would love being in the co-producer meetings, which happened probably once a month. And we would just sit there and listen and learn from the team who had been doing it for years and they were very very good at what they were doing but we also love to go in and watch the show because all the actors were brilliant but in particular Roger Bart had a different show every <laughs> single night and you just wouldn't know what he was going to do next and it made ev all the other actors really pay attention but you I mean we would be laughing at things that nobody else in the audience was laughing at because we had never seen him do it before so we would always as much as we could come in at the very least for act two which was his sort of his big tour de force moment and be snickering at the show. And I think a big part of being an effective pitcher is being madly in love with your show. Oh, that's essential. You, you know, if you're not good at pitching your show after a while, if you've practiced and practiced, you still can't get good at it. You want to really think about it. Is this really my show? Because that's a sure sign. Because, you know, we, we had one project, uh, few years ago and it was just you couldn't raise the money Larry Rogowski for it. story I think it was <laughs> we couldn't raise money for the thing and we are good at raising money <laughs> that's like one of our you know one of the feathers in our cap and man it was just a tough one to pitch and we realized well we just don't love it enough so you have to be madly in love with your show and when you are like I said before it doesn't matter what you say it's how you're saying it. it's the passion and it's the um it's, it's to your gut. It's like you speak to people on a totally different level and the right ones, the right ones, notice I said that, will get it. Can we talk about pitching a show at a party when you don't have like a formal, oh, wait, but someone raised their hand. You can do that? Oh my goodness, yes. someone raised wait. their hand. Hang on guys, we're gonna, someone named Nancy. we're gonna figure out, hi Nancy, my butt. So not working. Oh my god! Oh, you only okay, have Todd Rubin. He says you both look so great. I bet you don't even have the Zoom touch up filter on. We totally do. I did we didn't have it. We would look like this. I did all of this makeup. Design wait, wait, wait! I wanted to say something important. What? Oh, so you're at a party, and first you want to be known as a producer, right? Because probably a lot of people on on this call are dipping a toe in. Or if you have a project, it's actually a lot easier to say that you're a producer. So you're at a party, and someone says, "What do you do?" I want you to avoid saying, "I'm a school teacher, but I'm also a producer on the side." Mm. Okay or I'm a licensed massage therapist, but I also have a project on the side that I'm producing. I want you to own it. You go into a party and you say, hey, so great to meet you. Who invited you here? Oh, cool, yeah, I'm a friend of hers. I'm producing a show that we're working on together, right? And then you're in the conversation about producing and the right person goes, you're a producer? And the wrong person goes, oh, you know what I mean? And Leads people out right away and you wanna do that. There's too many, too many people, too little time. You know, so you wanna get, you wanna, 
you get to the no. I always like to say like, get yeah, it, get oh, it and go. So good. Get, get to, to the, the no, no and go. But when you get to the no, then you get to, who do you know? Yeah. Right? Oh, the theater's no, not. No is never a no. A no is a not right now, or I know somebody who. It's yeah. never a no. And when, do you want to say something about how you get to be a pain in the neck and how to avoid that? I don't know how to avoid that, but I do know how to get to be a pain in the neck. No, how do you avoid well, it? Well, that's it's 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 having you know one or two people that you're constantly pitching to. It's like always having oh. the same circle, but you have to expand that. How do you expand that? You got to be out meeting people, and always again, who do you know who, and like actually follow up on it because that's how you're going to meet the next person. You can get all the who do you know who's, and then if you never actually reach out to anybody new, you're never going to meet the new people. So you have to have a I call it a funnel, a funnel of people. That's like constantly to, to go through and you're always adding new beans to that jar daily, always new beans. So don't be afraid to get out to networking events and, you know, places where theater folks hang out or movie folks hang out or, you well, know, people that- well, when it's safe to go out. Now they're all hanging out on your computer screen. You they are one DM away on Instagram. Mm -hmm. well, Nancy, there's someone named Nancy who had a question and it went away. Or she raised her hand. Nancy, you did something. Nancy How do we raised find her you? Hand, but I don't know if she actually asked. Nancy, will you type something to us so we don't neglect you? Oh my gosh, we missed a bunch. Okay, so yeah. um, should we talk about how to effectively reach out to someone via social media without being weird? So there's a little bit of yeah. prep work that it's always good to do on social media before you reach out to someone on social media. First, you want to scrub your own socials. So for example, if you have pictures of you being like drunk boy, you know what I mean? And doing things that are irresponsible or saying things that are denigrating towards fill in the blank, any uh, anyone on the planet, uh, Probably clean it up. Yep. Yeah, you want to clean it up. Yeah. <laughs> I people think. are watching you. I think a lot of people don't realize that. Like sometimes you're actually being stalked by people, you know, and they're looking at all your stuff. I stalked. And no, they're you looking get at all stalked. your stuff. You mm -hmm. get stalked. Yes, I'm you always get. like, how'd you know that about me? <laughs> oh, right. Oh, I gotta take that down. <laughs> you know, we have to be careful what we put up there. It's that's this is the world we're in now. Let's face it. And now people have the time to go through that stuff and they're looking. Not just employers, which they, they're definitely looking, but just anybody, you know, it's just, it's like dating. So scrub, scrub your social before, and I, I will say about social media, hmm. figure out who you want to meet and what age they are. So like Larry and I are big on the mom genes of social media, also known as Facebook, because we're, one of us is nearly 50 and the other one is 22. Um, so Facebook, like we grew up with Facebook. Um, if you want to, approach someone who's really big on Instagram, make sure that you have at least something going on on Instagram, even if it's just a week's worth of stuff before you find out about them and post what it is that you want them to know about you so that they'll have a reason to engage, right? So we've been hiring interns this week because we actually have more to do than we ever have before. And if I can't find any of my interns on social media, I'm not going to reach out to them because they're all in their 20s. And if they can't be found on social media, then I don't want to work with them to help improve our social media. Make sense? So that's one of your homework assignments. If you have people who are on your wish list, your dream team of who you want for your um, team, if you want someone as an investor, a star, a director, a co-producer, a general manager, a, a team member, someone who you just think you'd vibe with, Make sure that you present yourself in the best light. And the way to do that now while we're all COVIDing is to present yourself through social media. Yeah? Absolutely. Hey, just wanted to say hello. Hello, Nancy. That's what you wanted to say. <laughs> Danielle, all that we waited for you forever. Yeah, Danielle, our buddy Danielle. That's nice. We do so love that, Danielle. We do, we do, we do. <laughs> okay, what else do we want to cover? So we, we wanted to talk about... Um, building your theater skills and building your theater relationships under quarantine. So first, oh, I want to pitch some stuff, you guys. Okay, not my own stuff, but like amazing things for my family. National Theater Live, NT Live, is releasing one free, extremely high quality production per week. They already had one man, two governors with, funny guy, James, oh, Corden. James Corden. 
and then Jane Eyre, and I got through Jane Eyre, which is a horrible story because the acting is transcendent. And starting, I think, tonight is Treasure Island, which is uh -huh. age 10 and up. So if you have a 10-year-old, or like Larry, you have a son who is younger but always watches things that are age inappropriate, then you should definitely it's tune in you know? to Treasure Island. But if you don't know what to post on social media because you're just basically hanging out in your pajamas and waiting for this to end, then go to all the sites, um, broadway.com, Broadway Broadwayworld.com, theatermania.com, uh, Playbill. Mm -hmm. um, see what's going on. Watch some stuff. You know, we watched Bandstand the other night. That was a fundraiser for the Actors Fund, so we were very happy to um, to pitch that to to support that with our whopping six dollars and ninety nine cents. But we were dancing around the living room with Bandstand, and then anybody mm -hmm. who had anybody who had posted anything about Bandstand that week, I just couldn't help it. I posted yes. I know, I love it, it's amazing, just because it was so much joy. So find the commonalities with the people that you wanna reach out to. Mm. And you're gonna, that's a great way to find people who are interested in the same stuff you're interested in. And then when you do have a project to pitch, you're gonna know who to pitch to. Cause you always wanna match, call it matching product to people. I guess you, you got so say. quiet. Oh, was I yelling? I don't know. Do I, I, so, I'm trying I to break. Know, you, got, okay. just gotta, you know, I gotta okay. buffer this a little you bit, people. Yourself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you really you want to you want to be able to like you know where projects. Just going back to pitching for a second. What projects you have? Because um, mostly you're usually not even just going to have one project. You're just going to be a few projects, or at least over time you'll have a few. So you want to match them to the different people that you're talking to. Yeah. Would you agree? I would. Hmm. I certainly would. And then during Corona time, how would you say people can move forward with their actual projects and like maybe who, all right, let, let's actually address this because this is a little bit elephanty. Mm -hmm. um, sure. How do you raise funds during my, 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 my Corona? All right. So first you want to find the people who still have income. I think that's important. And in general, we try to pitch theater to people who are happy to lose, their, or maybe not happy to lose their money, but if they lose their 25, 50, 100, $250,000 investment, they'll still be able to eat. They'll still be able to send their grandchildren to college. They'll still be right. able to live their lives. They won't notice. And that's in a perfect world. And of course, you know, when you're talking about the 1% or the 5% or the 30% probably in New York, um, then what you're looking at is people who, the pandemic might be affecting them, but they still have disposable income to play with and build a relationship with them and get them to catch your vision. Okay, and again, everybody knows somebody who's gonna be excited and honored to be part of your project. And one of the things that you can always offer, particularly if you're the lead producer or the option holder on the property, is you can offer title. What's title? I'd like you to be an associate producer. I'd like you to be a co-producer. I'd like you to be a general partner with me because you have skills or you have funds that I don't have. So my expertise mm -hmm. and your money together will make a beautiful show when shows are being made again. Just for some of the people, can you break down what those things are? Because I think maybe a yes. you know, general partner, oh, co-producer, yes. what that all means. Okay, so producer means just about anything. Um, <laughs> it seriously does. Because people say I'm a producer and I'll be like, I don't know you in the Broadway community. And they'll be like, well, it's the guy that I would have to do that. So in the world of theater, <laughs> a lead producer is the person who holds the option and the right to produce the show, okay? Mm -hmm. And options in theater have limits. So you can option a show for a year, for 18 months, for two years, for five years, if your writer had no idea what they were doing, okay? So you hold the option in order to produce the project and that makes you the lead producer. Now, what you'll see by the time a show gets to Broadway is you will see two, three, four, sometimes five general partners. They're the people on top, the very top line. And then there's going to be a break and then there's going to be a million little names and smaller fonts. So the general partners will all take on an equal share of responsibility for raising the funds in a show. So let's say we have four general partners and it's a $10 million raise. Each general partner is responsible for raising Two and a half million. Two and a half million dollars. Now, if you are the original producer, the lead producer, the one who actually acquired the option and did the original legwork, sometimes you will be what's called the torch bearer, and you will get torch bearer points in exchange for being the person who shepherded the projects from the hardest points at the very beginning to legitimacy. We're on Broadway. And torch bearer points will just mean that when you're in profits, you as a torch bearer will, will take a lion's share of producer profits. Remember when we first, when we were new producers, we saw torch bearer, we were like, what 
laughing at that. We were like, and now we understand. Now we understand like, ah, they, they really the did the work. They took we such just, risk. We waltzed in so after you sense. already secured a theater, and we said, here's your half a million dollars, and let's sit at the table. And they did all the work for the two, six, eight, ten years before that. So that's yeah. general partner and lead producer. When you are a co-producer on Broadway, that is a um, sort of the next step down from lead producer. And that means that in exchange for bringing your talents to the table, and those talents usually mean fundraising, a certain threshold, but not always. It can mean other talents that you bring to the table, like promotions, social media, partnerships, group sales, all sorts of things like that. But by and large, co-producers are people who bundle or raise or write a check for a certain amount of money. It varies, but we will say that generally for a musical, that threshold begins at $250,000. We're starting to see it go up as costs mount for larger Broadway shows. Um, and but it will be interesting when we get back to the theater, what that's gonna start to look like, because right. shows may cost less. You know, there's gonna be a whole, we're gonna enter a whole new world, honestly, which a is very unknown. New okay. Okay. Uh <laughs> we did watch that last night though. <laughs> but, he has but the it, original <laughs> Aladdin with Robin Williams. You have to, my kids had never seen it. They were like, Jafar, Jafar, he's our man. If he can't do it, great. Okay, back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just thinking like, I mean, this is just conjecture, like what it's going to be when we get back to the theater, you know, that's Open say, season. Let, let's say it's a year from now. We hope it's not, but it could be, right? Mm -hmm. Like those, everything could look totally different as far as like how much you have to raise, how much a show is going to cost, Which what the ticket prices are going to be. Which means opportunities for new people to come on board. Yep. So we talk a lot about the Broadway space because that's where we've spent the bulk of our time but everybody starts somewhere and we've produced off Broadway and we've produced fringe shows and we have started to produce shows that didn't go anywhere. So we, you will be in every stage of the process. I mean, I think a lot of this we did backwards because we jumped on Broadway shows early because for us, the easier part was fundraising and the learning, the creative process, we didn't go to school for theater production. So we had to learn it by watching the best in the business do it. And that was, that is an extraordinary process. And I think that's one of the right. things we miss the most right now. Okay, mm -hmm. what else did we want to cover? So we wanted to cover pitching and picking. Oh, the picking of a project. How do you pick a project? How do you, so um, first, I think that passion is really important, like super important. In fact, we got- That's I number got, one. I mean, that's really, because if that's not there, nothing else matters. I got interested in Great Comet because I saw a production of Ghost Quartet Dave Malloy wrote Ghost Quartet, and I live in Brooklyn, and this was a production at the Bushwick Star, and there was one moment I remember that happened in the show where everything went completely pitch black. I mean, even the exit signs. It was totally terrifying mm. and thrilling. I'd never felt anything like it. And then there was another part in the show where they passed out actual shot glasses made of glass and poured scotch or whiskey or something They're fun. Daring. And we all did like a skull with the actors and the musicians, and did a shot and I was like, I don't actually know what I'm watching, but I have never experienced this in this intimacy. Like by the end of the show, everybody was like hugging each other, the audience I'm yeah. talking about. So when Great Comet was coming to Broadway and it was that guy, that ghost quartet guy, I was like, Larry, we got to check out the show. And then you add in some other attractive elements, i.e. Josh, Josh Groban, <laughs> Rachel Chavkin, Mimi Lian as our incredible set designer, uh, the ART and like just, all the elements came Sam together. Singleton. Sam Pinkleton. Pink single Sam it's Singleton. It's only because Larry wants him Who to be single. He is not single. Not single. We seriously have run out of time. We've just talked and talked. I know. Wait, does anybody else have <laughs> an actual question about an actual question? No, wait, wait, we, we didn't quite back. you can ask more questions, guys. We didn't quite finish though. So it has to talk to your your passion for the oh, project yes. thing. That's thing number one. But then you have to look at a lot of other factors. Like, is it a title that is going to be recognizable? Is it going to be a tough show to raise money for? Is it gonna be, um, you know, how big is the cast? What does it look like as far as production? Is it viable? Is it gonna be a $30 million show or a $3 million show? Or a $3,000 Or show. a $3,000 show. <laughs> Which we've like, done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to look at all those angles and then decide if it's the right time, the right time for you, the right time for the, um, the climate, the audiences. You know, so a lot is riding on that. Like, I can guarantee you guys, you know, when we get back to the theater, it's kind of like, when 9-11 happened, people are gonna want, they're gonna wanna go to the theater and they're gonna wanna see, like, they're gonna be entertained, like, big time. So, um, Like that's, Moulin Rouge, is that yeah, what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think about after 9-11, Mamma Mia was the hottest show. Let's make it so Satine right? doesn't die. That's what I was That'll thinking, be yeah, we gotta get rid of her consumption. 
<laughs> she, she just come back to life at the end. And she had I'm Corona, gonna... but there was a cure. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So passion for your project, picking the right project. If, if you love your project, there are another 4 billion people out there in the world. There's going to be somebody who's on your wavelength, somebody who's as crazy as you to catch the vision. And you probably don't know them, but using our handy dandy, who do you know who tool, you will find. <laughs> we should patent that. <laughs> you can find them. You, you can, and you will. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wrong <laughs> anyway every time that larry and i have come to the end of a list we're like we didn't ask the who do you know who because we're at the end of the list right. and if you keep asking that question you will never, never reach the end should of your end. list it'll mm -hmm. be like corona it never ends it should never it end like this too soon for topical pandemic jokes too soon it's never too soon for jokes okay. about anything <laughs> um but i think we're talking about coming to the end and they were just about at the end of this um we have to we have tonight. to tell them about broadway custom and why we're passionate about ooh, it and why we do it and ooh, why we're ooh, holding because broadway's holding holding so um some of you guys may have found out about this tonight through broadway custom which is which is our company and we have these incredible social sites so you can check out um broadway custom on facebook insta twitter instouche Instouche? Yeah. Is that how the Israelis that's say it? That's how the Israelis say it. Instouche. Instouche. Um, Twitter. That's how the Brits say it. <laughs> and Pinterest. I know. Who Wait, know? are we on Pinterest? We know. are. We totally are. Oh, good. What, uh, TikTok? But so what, are we tiktok -ing? We're not tiktok yet, but we should talk right. about what Broadway Custom is and why it's what we wanted when we were little, little. So talk about mm -hmm. producing your own shtick and what you're passionate about. When Larry and I were kids, there was this dream of Broadway, and occasionally we'd go to a Broadway show, but there was like no accent. Not for us, anyway. So what we did with Broadway Custom is we created our dream week. So it's a, a week of hardcore acting, singing, dancing, of course, with Broadway veterans and then you go to see shows you go backstage you go on stage you meet the actors and then lo and behold the actors come in tomorrow and teach you a dance combination from the show that you saw last night you meet with casting directors and agents we try uh based on the kids that we have in because it's age uh, 10 to 18 based on mm -hmm. the students we have in we try to bring in casting directors and agents who are specifically looking for or who represent those kinds of actors and performers and we also do skype calls before weeks and months even before kids come in so that we can get an idea of who they are, get them ready with their 16 bars, maybe their monologues, but also sense who they are. And also we do surprises because we ask them who their favorite performers are. And then, hey, you might just have a video of that person or that person might come in and visit with us. So we have panels with current kids that are in shows and their parents. And they tell amazing war stories about what it was like before they were in a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And we had one Anna or Elsa kid come in and talk about how she sat for 10 hours outside of an audition waiting to get seen, never got seen. So all sorts of cool insider stuff to show the glamour, but more importantly, the grit of Broadway. So finally, because we always wanted this for ourselves, but never thought it could exist, we made it. So if you have a <laughs> We call it Broadway Custom because it's customized. We really customize it to the group that's coming in. Like that's, that's such a key element of it when we do those initial interviews with the kids is finding out like who they want to meet, who, who do they look up to, who would, who would starstruck them is that a proper yeah 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 absolutely why not who they would be starstruck by uh, no we, who would we, starstruck them, would star I like it. them. yeah, yeah. It. so we bring that it's it's really special yeah we we love it and we're we have a lot of people doing a lot of online stuff a lot of online schools we are not going to do that because the joy for us we're going to celebrate when broadway comes back so in the meantime we're going to keep the dream alive and we're going to keep doing some of these webinars. So keep on the lookout on, oh, yeah. on Broadway Custom social page for the next one. If you um, guys have specific topics that you want us to yeah. discuss, like Larry's fabulous tan, we can talk about that. Oh, we have a giveaway. Oh my gosh, we forgot our giveaway. We had a giveaway, a conversation with us, you remember? Oh, yes. For the best yes. question. Okay, so you guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick... The best question, we're not going to do that because we have too many questions. Too bad. But, okay. We're going to pick the best question and that person gets a 15-minute Zoom with us to ask anything. Anything. Ooh. Um, right? That's our deal today? Because we promise. Yeah. Todd Rubin, watch it. <laughs> I know exactly where you're going with that. Okay, gang. Um, this Thank is great. Thanks for being so with us so much tonight. for joining us. Go see a Broadway show in two dimensions. Oh, and oh, can I just, <laughs> can I pitch one more thing? Is that okay? You guys, um, Larry and I are both very involved in Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, mm -hmm. Broadway's charity. So all the people that you know, when you know, who do you know who, 
who want to figure out what they can do with the money that they're not spending on theater right now. Broadway is closed, but Broadway's charity is wide, wide, wide open. So if you want to donate, we have an extraordinary COVID-19 fund. You can just go to broadwaycares.org and see all these beautiful initiatives. We're going to start a red bucket campaign that normally is live in person in the in the theaters right about now, we're gonna start a virtual red bucket campaign to keep the doors open at Broadway Cares Equity Fight States so we can continue helping everybody on Broadway during our brief interval. We have one more quick question. We might, let's answer it now. It's from Ethan, I'm gonna read this. Uh, I'm, I'm taking on a project as producer but haven't lead produced before and feel I won't do as good of a job as an experienced producer. Not necessarily true. Um, how do I approach a more experienced producer or do I just do, as good of a production as I can and go from there. That's really up to you. However, there is he something- He just answered his own question because the way that you no. approach a more experienced producer is awesome. I'm t Hi, blank producer. I'm taking on project as a producer. Mm -hmm. I haven't lead produced before, but I have a million ideas and great resources. However, you have. Together, we could be a fantastic team. When do you have a few minutes for a phone call? And that could look a lot of different ways. One of the ways it could look is to bring them on as executive producer, which is basically a producer for hire, right? So you we can bring do on, that. We do that, right. So that you bring on someone who has experience and they basically shepherd, they'll walk you through everything that needs to happen with the show. Sorry, sorry. So, um, you know, there's many Oh, it's somebody cute. Ways. Somebody cute. Her husband. Okay, I'll call you back. <laughs> He's pretty cute, actually. So, cute. Um, so you know, I, I would say go for it, Ethan, but if you really feel like, oh, I need someone to hold my hand, I need someone to actually do the producing work, then seek out um, an executive producer, and that might be the answer for you. You know, the very first show that I was a co-producer on before I dragged Larry into this because I never want to do it alone again was a show called Dr. Zhivago, and, and it had an extraordinary <laughs> executive producer Sue Frost, yes. who went on to be the lead producer in a small show called Come From Away. And Sue was the voice of reason, mm -hmm. expertise, and calm in a storm. And that is my, when we executive produce, that's my gold standard. If I can be like yeah. Sue Frost. I think that's a great note to, to end this on. If I could be like Sue Frost. <laughs> Sue Frost, if you're out there listening. <laughs> That, this we one's for you. That's right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. We'll come back to you soon with a brand new hot topic that will be wildly appropriate for theater. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. bye.